Uh, we're still in this time frame of talking about post-war European art. So we're looking at, or we have been looking at really at a, a range of artists' work. Um, and we can find some links you know, between uh, one artist and another. But at the same time, there's really a lot of diversity um, within this, within this post-war period. Um, one of the things we were talking about previously was this kind of thread or theme of existentialism or existential thinking or kind of philosophical outlook that's um, kind of running between a lot of artists' work. And I think we can even kind of you know, spoon Fontana a little bit um, in that direction as well. Um, Fontana in the, um, he actually dies in the late 60s, like 68 or 69, I think. Um, but his kind of final body of work is essentially what we're looking at here. So it's work he does in like the last 10 or 15 years um, of his life. Um, he's known for, and we'll actually look at two bodies of work. He's known for these paintings, um, some pretty large scale, such as we hear, some a little bit smaller, um, but also sculptures as well. And even though, on one hand, the two are very different, certainly in terms of media and you know, form and so on, you can also see some conceptual similarities between the two in which he was really trying to open up the surface of the painting. So what was typical about these works is that, um, you know, they're basically, you know, stretched canvas, so, you know, canvas on a, on a frame, um, very bright colors. And that's something I think that doesn't necessarily, almost like what we think of today as like day glow, you know, kind of neon kinds of colors, really, you know, intensely saturated bright. The kind of color that when you stand in front of, it kind of makes you wince a little bit, you know, because you have it, you know, this, there's this literal, you know, kind of intensity to the color itself. And then with these canvases, um, in some cases they were cut open, you know, kind of like thinly sliced, such as we see here. Um, and some other canvases, we'll see an example of one in just a moment. You can see where they've been like poked um, rather than slit open. Some responses to his work was that it seemed like it was violent, like he was doing violence to the paintings. Um, when he talked about making these paintings, though, he talks, he talks about it in a way in which it's very considered and very thoughtful. Um, there's photographic you know, documentation of him you know, working, and he's, he's not attacking the, you know, the paintings necessarily, but in the photographs you really get the sense he's standing back, he's thinking, he's looking, he's very carefully you know, cutting in um, to the surface, you know, surfaces or opening up the surfaces of his paintings. Collectively, the work is known as the um, as spatial concepts or concept spatial. Um, I think that's how it's listed. Uh, oh, this isn't the one that's exactly in, exact in the textbook, but it's very similar um, to the one that's in the text. There's also, we can look at this work here. Um, so this is one where he's you know, cutting it with a sharp knife. Um, this is another example of one of his paintings in which um, he's you know, opening it. I think, he, I think this was done with a pair of scissors, actually, so he's kind of gouging it or you know, poking the uh, surface of the painting. The title of this one, I think, is notable, too, because it has this, you know, so, you know the, the second part of the title says, you know, the end of God. And I think it's, really, again, important to keep in mind you know, that the, the influence of existentialism in this time frame, because there's, um, there's so many people, philosophers, writers, artists, you know, musicians, you know, kind of intelligentsia in general, um, who were, who were you know, in this post-war period of time are considering, um, you know, maybe there is a God, you know, but maybe, you know, are really concerned about, you know, the, what is moral, you know, what is immoral. And again, if you put it into the context of this time frame, um, you know, the 20th century, you've seen two major wars, the second, you know, war being even more devastating than the first, the Holocaust, um, increasingly, you know, people understanding what happened during the Holocaust. Um, you know, millions of people, you know, um, exterminated, essentially, in this intent uh, to exterminate the entire, um, you know, ethnic group of people, uh, is really overwhelming um, to a lot of people, you know, to a lot of individuals. I think that's important to keep in mind. The, um, there was an exhibition of Fontana's work, I mean, in this last body of work, um, about a year and a half ago, and uh, so kind of collectively brought a lot of this work together, and also this um, sculptures as well. We'll look at in just a moment. And this is a review of the show. It was in New York, and this was a review that was Art, Art in America. And the, the writer, I think, kind of explains the work um, nicely and you know, kind of really um, concisely. So I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I want to read um, some snippets from it. So um, the writer is Anne Doran, and she says, um, you know, avant garde means ultra baroque. That's interesting. Um, in the works of Argentine born Italian artist Lucio Fontana, 
um, the last two decades of whose vast and varied output was, sur was surveyed in this exhibition. Uh, and it was organized by Italian uh, curator Germano Savant and Gigutian director Valentina Castellani. Uh, and it included over 100 paintings, drawings, sculptures, as well as reconstructions of six of Fontana's rarely seen immersive environments. And that's really notable, too, because in this time frame, artists are beginning to think, and we'll, we'll begin to talk about it soon, so they're beginning to think about not just creating objects, you know, discrete objects in a painting or a sculpture, but spaces in which the space or the environment is the, is the work itself. Um, in the late 1940s, um, galvanized by the atomic age scientific advances, Montana imagined a spatialist art that would reflect man's transformed understanding of matter and the universe and, and perhaps even of the divine. For him, this meant finding a way to go beyond canvas and sculpture and somehow merge space with form. And I think that in just you know, a sentence, actually, that really explains his work and puts it into the context of the time. Because that's the other issue. You know, we've talked so much about um, the effects of the war, and really kind of talking about the European theater. If we think about the Pacific you know, theater of war, um, you know, it concludes with um, you know, the United States detonating atomic weapons um, you know, for the first and really only time um, you know, in, in terms of a military conflict as opposed to just you know, testing. And, um, and that leads to a whole new understanding and concern and anxieties, um, certainly as well. So I think it's interesting that that, um, you know, that, that issue is brought into play. Um, as is evident here, Fontana's efforts often resulted in works as gaudy in their execution as they were radical in concept. Um, the earliest pieces in the exhibitions are his whole paintings, the first made in 1949. Canvas is perforated with various tools and patterns ranging from zigzags to nebula-like aggregations. All are titled spatial concepts, sometimes with a subtitle or a number. Some are monochrome, some are stained with veils of various colors. The best are encrusted, and I haven't seen these, I'm not aware of these. The best are encrusted with sand, glitter, and chunks of colorful Murano glass, um, such as the yellow canvas from 1956 with a central amoeboid shape. Um, built up out of sparkling red, turquoise, and, and yellow um, charms. More spatial concepts followed in the form of elegant pet paintings, canvases, often bright monochromes, marked by thin vertical slits, and that's more like um, you know, this, um, this work here, for which Montana is best known. Um, and all of these works, oops, oh, I'm just printed in such a way I can't read the top of that sentence. Ah, so that is, that's very strange, that's a weird, formatting error. Okay, well, I'd like to read the rest of that, but it, it printed very strangely. His other, because the next thing that the, the reviewer talks about um, are his sculptures, so I'll just I'll deviate you know, from the review and we'll just look at the work. Um, he also created these bronze um, sculptures, again, under various um, titles, as we call nature. Uh, sometimes they're exhibited, um, such as you see here, you know, in the space of uh, the gallery. Um, they're really, in, in many ways, meant to be seen not just as singular objects, but as multiples. And they're also shown um, in the out of doors as well. This is a, oh, there's a, not much, oh yeah, that is called right. Um, this is the Hirshhorn Museum um, in Washington, D.C., and they kind of dot in the sculpture garden outside of the building. They um, kind of dot um, the landscape and move around the landscape. And these, I think, are interesting, especially in relationship to the paintings, because essentially it's a sphere, you know, that's been that appears as if it's been slit open or cut open. When you look at these closely, um, you can really you can imagine the original material that he's working with clay or wax, um, which you know is then replaced with bronze, you know, through the casting process. And when you look at him, you can really imagine the tools that he was using, the knife or whatever you know, kind of tool that he was using. And you can really see how it's been cut into that surface and it's almost kind of prying it um, open. So again, I think there's this, this idea of the hand of the artist or almost, um, although he certainly didn't see it as violent, I think sometimes it gets read as a kind of a violent reaction. But when you look at these, do they remind you of anything else? Of walnuts, right? Of nuts or seeds, right? Like they're kind of ready to, they're starting to crack and, and open. And I think that's really notable because it can be, I think this work can really be an interpreted in more than one way. You know, is it the hand of the artist or the individual who's digging into it, you know, and opening it up? Or is it, you know, something that's germinated in a sense, you know, like a seed that's growing and it's about to pop, you know, pop open? And that's maybe a little more positive, um, you know, certainly way of thinking. 
bad. But I think it's a kind of work that, you know, depending on your particular point, point of view, you may come at it, um, you know, from uh, certainly um, from more than one angle. And again, I think there's a connection, even though, you know, formally they're very different objects than the paintings, this idea of this discrete form, which has been opened up in some way, is a, the theme that carries from the um, Zerlington paintings to, uh, to the sculptures themselves. Um, Marina, uh, Maridi is uh, another Italian artist, so we can put in this, this category of, of post-war, and it's again, really generic category of post-war European. He is one of the artists whose work, um, and he has this pattern, um, this kind of theme or this motif that he works with over and over again um, in different media and different materials. Um, he's one of the artists whose work is, is directly reflective of his experiences um, in the war. And whether he's creating, um, you know, bronze uh, sculptures, drawings, or even paintings, um, this one here is they're generally just referred to as the horse and rider series. The ones that we see here, the sculptures on the left, are not exactly the same as the ones in the textbook, but really similar. Um, and I'll also show you this. I I was in um, Milwaukee a few couple of years ago and visited the art museum there, and I thought that this was a, a nicely curated. Um, part of the, the um, museum where they had one of his sculptures, and um, and then behind it, you, as you saw, at, this was actually in sort of a, a smaller room. So this was the angle you took as you kind of walked into this space. So you'd see a sculpture by him down below, but then in the background were his paintings, um, and they create a, a kind of backdrop or a, a, one one sort of reflects the other. But for Marini, one of the things that he talked about was that during the war. Um, in Italy, he had um, he basically fled to the hills. Um, so he somebody lived in the city. He was you know going to the country, which makes sense because cities were getting you know bombed. You know the countryside itself you know wasn't you know being bombed because it's open space and you know fewer people and fewer targets. Um, but cities certainly were targets. And so there was a one of the things he talked about is that there was this kind of exodus um, to the country that people were leaving um, essentially by any means necessary. Um, most of the fuel was for vehicles was really hard to get because it was being you know used for the war effort, and so people were um, traveling by foot and by horses and you know donkeys and, and so on. And um, one of the experience he, experiences he had was seeing somebody who was riding a horse be shot, and so the person was shot and then fell you know and fell to the ground. And it's a it's a you know an image that really haunted him in a lot of ways, and so he just essentially is revisiting it over and over again um, in this work um, in you know in various ways. So and I think that when you know that about the work, it's kind of haunting as well, um, and because you can just kind of see a, you know an individual you know who's kind of processing something you know over an you know, extended uh, period of time. Um, another Italian is um, Giacomo Manzu, and he's known. Primarily for a series of these um, standing figures uh, that are referred to as the cardinal series, or the title is just referred to as a standing cardinal in and, uh, and, and various scales, but most of them are life size or a little over life size. And you know they're figurative; they um, depict you know, and it's identifiable by the head here, basically. Um, the the figure is identifiable as a cardinal within the Roman Catholic Church. And I'm curious as to, to how you read these sculptures in a in a motive or psychological kind of way. How do you respond to them? Stoic. Closed off. Yeah, stoic. Closed off. What else was the other thing? Um, what was the last I thing? Just, I said it was like stoic or just not really expressive at all. Yeah, yeah, so everything's kind of smoothed over. They have these really serious expressions. They're almost intimidating. Because they're just kind of like, I imagine if you would be in front of it, it'd just be kind of staring you down with this face that's just like intense. Yeah, it's very impassive. But yeah. There's certainly like an intensity there. there. I get a sense of tension between me and the figure. Yeah. Anything else? Well, they seem kind of like they're protective, like they're holding themselves. Yeah, kind of like the cloak, you know, cloak that they're wearing is almost sort of kind of like shield like or protective like, something like that. Armor like. How tall are they? They, um, so they vary in height. They're about, 
Um, the ones that I've seen, one of them, and I've seen some of the person here. I think they're about six to eight feet tall. Or so. Yeah, so they, they're bigger than like a, a human. Yeah, they're about life size. But and then the the hat is also you know adds to the height as well. But they're about life. They're a little bigger than life size, I think, for the average. In terms of the average person, so that's kind of intimidating, I think, in terms of the scale. So one thing I think that's interesting about them is, well, actually, let me put this into a question. If you consider that they're representatives of the church, do you think that that has meaning, or what kind of meaning do you can you, do you think you can pull from that? Like, what is he saying about? And the, and cardinals are very, are very high ranking um, within the within the church. Sometimes the cardinals are. Um, in a traditional sense, have been referred to as the princes of the church um, in terms of their rank. Yeah. Like you said, you've got a very smoothed over. Like it seems kind of a juxtaposition about the Catholic churches. I don't know what the right word is, but like there's no decoration on there. There's not a lot of anything that shows all the intricate details that are mm -hmm. typically on the robes of state. Mm -hmm. So maybe he, I would take it as though he's saying, Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a kind of simplification. It's like less, uh, less ornate, less about the wealth of the church, maybe. So anybody, and you might, this might be something you've come across either on your own or in another class, but does anybody know about the role of the church during the war? Yeah, and you say, yeah. <laughs> what about the role of the, the church during the war? It certainly varies according to individuals, it's, but institutionally there's something. And there's even still today information coming out. It's really interesting because they kind of tried to play it off as another crusade of sorts. It was, it was a way for them to, to kind of intervene in you know, a, a holy manner with what was going on in Europe and what was going on in that general area because that was kind of, there were, there were a lot of sentimental attachments that were going on where the, where the fighting was going on. And it was causing a lot of damage to, you know, think places that were considered holy sites, places, uh, you know, artifacts that were considered holy artifacts, and they really kind of wanted to use it as an excuse to put more power towards having the, the religious aspect there mm -hmm. of, of, of sacred of, in terms of sacred sites. Yeah, places. and also, you know, it's. You're, you're talking about a war against a guy who was basically mass persecuting everybody mm -hmm. that, that were that was against, and that included faiths mm -hmm. of, of all sorts. And it was just a way for them to kind of help root out what they viewed as evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's that angle of it. Anybody else? Anything else? Yeah, because it's 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 a complicated. Yeah. Um, I heard on a show in the morning a story about how um, you know they're they're just finding out all these connections and stuff like that. They really stood on the fence and played both sides and were concerned with themselves financially and really building up their their banking system and everything. It wasn't until there was a clear user that they really disassociated themselves with the move with the Nazi party and. Um, that they cashed in a lot of like insurance policies to the people that were killed in, in the concentration camps and ways that um, they knew. Yeah. It, they knew. Yeah, and this is in this this particular story is, and as I mentioned, there's still stories coming out about it. Um, and this is just really recent, so this isn't something that um, you know that this artist would have necessarily had an understanding of. But what what was understood, and it was the sense of collusion, and it and it and it varied. Some of it was institutional, you know. Some of it was individuals, um, because certainly you had individuals within the church who were trying to protect Jews, who were against um, the Nazis. Um, but you also had elements of the church, individual, you know, and you know, institutional that was in, in collusion, and, and also to the the complicated you know history of Italy during the war. Is that initially, um, you know, they're under the control of Mussolini, um, a dictator who shared a lot of similarities, um, you know, with Hitler. 
And uh, so they're they're allies, you know, of Hitler and the Nazi government. And then through the and then through the course of the war, that changes, and then they become allied, you know, with our side, you know, as it were. Um, so there's that kind of shift um, that happens as well. So there's a lot of ambiguity if you think about the um, you know the history of Italy during the war, um, but also of the church because it is a really significant institution, um, cultural and religious, you know, institution within the war as well. It, it's it's hard it's it's hard to really break you know fully break it out and people in this time frame are just beginning to start to deal with that yeah I, I think it was you know I mean it's all about the struggle of roots because that area was heavily rooted in that tradition mm -hmm. and in that culture so I mean when you're talking about, oh yeah permeates yeah when, when yeah. you're talking about you know the the capital of that faith basically being in in an area that's heavily controlled by the war and heavily controlled by you know fascist communities and Hitler and Mussolini and all of that, you you could see why they would be torn between having to pick between their roots mm -hmm. and what was right or wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, really, yeah. So I mean, and yeah, there's that ambiguity or or conflict kind of layers of complication. And the reason I want to take a moment to think about that is like, I feel that with these sculptures, it, it's hard to tell in some ways what they're really about. Because on one hand, they're really solid forms. And I think this idea of seeing it almost the cape is like armor, you know, in a way. Um, they're they're obelisk-like in some ways. I mean, if you think about Egyptian obelisks. Um, and uh, although we associate Egyptian ob obelisks with, you know, ancient Egypt, they're also something that were, um, you know, basically, um, you know, captured and taken out of an Egyptian context and, and placed in, into Europe uh, as early as you know, I think you see um, some obelisks coming into being placed in public places in Europe in like the 16th century. Um, so, and the idea of an obelisk is that these monu they're these monuments and they're they're understood as ancient. You know, these vertical forms, kind of pillar-like or post-like. Um, and they're markers of time, you know, they make references to, you know, long, you know, periods of time. And so these sculptures have this, and they're kind of strong and impassive in a way. So on one hand, and again, it, 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 I think it depends on the point of view of the viewer, is that you can look at these sculptures and you can see a reference to an institution that has existed for a long period of time, which has withstood a lot of conflict, you know, it's this kind of powerful force. But I think you could also look at these sculptures and be very critical of the church or see them as being critical of the church because it, it, they're protecting themselves and they seem very inwardly focused. They're not necessarily you know, active um, forms or active um, uh, figures uh, in that respect. So um, I think Mansu is also a little bit on the, on the fence in some ways in terms of the it's a really sculptures. It's stark yeah. image when it comes to religious imagery because mm -hmm. most religious imagery see is very open mm -hmm. like you, you know the, the characters in them are really you know they're either reaching they're... out or pulling in people right. and these ones are really just stay away i'm an individual yeah i'm, I'm hiding myself in my cloak yeah and when and you get yeah, because when you look at yeah. the iconography of religious imagery it's often you know trying to connect with the viewer yeah. or there's even uh a, um, a standard image of Mary, and there are even some saints where you see this as well, where they're wearing a cloak, but their arms are out, yeah, they're out. and they're, they're they're almost like a mother hen with chicks, you know, and they've got you know people you know in the cloak. So this is a very different you know kind of imagery. And again, I think it begins uh, it begins to make more sense again in the context of the time of this time frame um, when people you know the artists included are you know reflective of what has uh, you know certainly what's happened in. And again, kind of, um, you know, they're, they're conflicted sculptures, I think, but they're really born in a lot of, they're born of a conflicted time. Um, some other, and this is such a, 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 you know, startling, you know, difference from that work here, uh, certainly in media, but also in intensity and color. The, uh, and from here we're switching away from talking about some Italian artists to uh, French artists, like close to Spain. And another um, trend we'll see, too, during this time frame is a lot of artists who, are reflecting on past traditions and in some ways keeping alive um, you know, past traditions, some a little more recent, some um, older. Um, with this work here called Agrigence, it's um, a painting. I've always been when you look at it, it almost looks like cut papers and things. 
Um, but it is a painting. The, the white um, that you see is actually um, pigment uh, as opposed to the white, uh, white canvas. For some reason, I had the opportunity to see this painting um, in an exhibition one time, and I'd always thought it was bright colors on a white surface. Uh, you know, white canvas, and then I realized that it's all painted. Um, but I think it because it has that quality of almost like that paper, like these forms are you know, sort of laid down on that surface. The um, the colors are really intense, really uh, really bright. It seems non-representational, um, unless you know that the title uh, refers to a, a place in France. And if you look carefully at it, you know, begin to realize that you're actually it's the, you know the colors are are not local, um, or they don't look naturalistic. But what you're looking at are fields here, so we can see it's a kind of linear perspective happening, um, hills, and then you know, sort of a blue sky, this bright red sky. And in this respect, it's very, very similar um, to Fauvism in some ways. And it's, it's created in the 1950s, you know, decades after um, you know, Fauvism really has its heyday, but it's reflective of the, of the Fauve style. And that's what I mean by it's a continuation of an earlier um, form or an earlier variant of modernism. If you think of the kind of work that Matisse was doing um, when Fauvism is the, in development in that first decade um, in the 20th century, um, it has a lot of similarities with intense colors, bright blue, especially that particular that cadmium red um, hue that uh, Matisse really loved uh, during this uh, time, well, probably through his whole life, but especially during this time frame. But I think it's also um, worth thinking about the kind of work that Matisse was making in the early 1950s. This is um, a cut paper um, piece. Uh, Matisse uh, dies in, I think it's 1954, so it makes it the, right around the middle um, of the decade. Um, he was working really you know, just steadily up until the time of his death. And in the last few years of his life, um, he was doing um, work that was really, I mean, he was doing a lot of cut paper pieces, but in many cases with the intention that those would be translated into um, ceramic tiles or in the stained glass, so in the textiles of one form or another. And it had a lot to do with his physical limitations. He had a lot of health problems. He was, um, uh, it was hard for him to move. He was wheelchair bound. He had um, arthritis in his hands. And so he really couldn't paint um, or draw uh, necessarily the way that he had in the past. But he was continuing you know, uh, to be a really uh, productive artist. And so, um, and also too, and his work was was still well known. He was one of those kind of superstars of the century that was getting attention um, throughout uh, his life. So I think if you can if you make some comparisons here and see Nicholas de Sale, a younger artist who's doing work that's reflective of Matisse and, and earlier traditions, and also in this respect too, it's that it's this kind of work that doesn't um, necessarily make direct um, references to the war. It's work that kind of exists outside of that. Um, you know, that, if you think of that as a historical kind of narrative, it's outside of, of that um, narrative. Um, we can also say um, the same thing about Giorgio Morandi as a, an Italian artist as well, um, is he um, begins creating a, a series of, of paintings, usually just referred to as still life, or sometimes it'll be still life with, you know, and a description of the objects. These are, are paintings that are on a relatively modest scale, so we're seeing them, you know, certainly much larger, uh, reproduced here much larger. Um, but when we think of still life painting, still life painting has a you know, history going back to the 17th century when we think of um, uh, Dutch painting and the development of still life as a, as a genre in itself or a bona fide genre. And Morandi essentially um, you know, kind of brings this kind of work back into play. And one of the ways that um, scholars have, have talked about his work is that it's very carefully arranged in the way we generally associate with uh, still life paintings. Um, and a common comparison that's made between his work and historical work is not so much with Dutch Baroque painting, but is with a Spanish Baroque painter by the name of Juan Sanchez um, Catan. And this is probably his best known painting, but one of the things that was typical of Catan's work was that he arranged the objects in a way that was kind of unnatural in some ways, like hanging you know, the, the fruit and the cabbage and so on, but creates this sort of perfect composition. And it's a balance, it creates this kind of balance of light and dark. So for example, you have these objects here that create kind of a curving arc, um, you know, such as we see here, you know, this kind of um, black, inky blackness. But then the, um, but there's also light shining on this, it's almost like a window, kind of like the side of the window here and down below, that creates a kind of opposing arc in a way, so you've got the objects curving one way, 
and then the sort of reverse L shape, you know, arc, you know, you know roughly arc like form on the other side. But they're very, very meticulously considered and very um, carefully arranged. And there's a kind of quietness, I think, to the work, a kind of a psychological quietness um, that's often commented on as well. So again, with somebody like Mirandi, I think I've got one other, oh, no, I thought I had one other, that's a huge change too. So with Mirandi, there's this kind of calm, reflective, um, you know, con there's really no content in a sense. I mean, there's a depiction of objects, but he's not necessarily um, you know, telling a story or telling a narrative. Now, telling a story or a narrative, that's where I meant to make this um, segue to Baltus. Um, there are probably many narratives here. They might vary from person to person. Um, and Baltus didn't like to talk about his work. Uh, he very rarely talked about it. And so that's caused um, you know, you know, other artists, curators, art historians, critics, and so on, um, to try to make sense out of his work. And, and it also tends to be work that makes people feel a little uncomfortable um, all at the same time. Uh, Baltus, like a lot of artists that we've talked about in this time frame, uh, you know, has his, his start or you know, the, the beginning of his career um, before the war. Uh, and so Baltus is you know, one of his early paintings go back into the 1930s. And his um, and there's a surrealist quality to this to his work um, throughout his life, and he lives a, a good long time. Um, but stylistically, his his paintings tend to um, be very similar uh, across decades. And what you see in this painting here, which is the example that's in your textbook, is typical of a lot of his work, in that you see young girls often uh, in positions that seem kind of sexual or sexualized, some more overtly than others. But then there's also things that are happening that make, it, make you wonder what exactly is happening. And that's a kind of typical surrealist strategy, is that you have these strange juxtapositions, but you don't necessarily explain what's going on. The viewers have to make um, sense out of it. So here we've got this girl kind of suggestively posed on a chaise. Um, there's a man making this raging fire you know, in the fireplace. And so you know, it, it, it you know, kind of just um, you know, sort of brings up a lot of questions. And for Baltus, and Baltus, I think, tends to be very perplexing to a lot of people. They don't, sometimes don't know whether it's a love him or hate him. Um, as a painter, he's been hugely, and, and I mean this in terms of the physical act of painting, he's been hugely influential on artists. Um, there, just in terms of the way he applies paint. And he's also one of those artists whose work is deceptively simple when you see it in reproduction. And that seeing it in person, there's a lot of complexity beyond just the, the complexity of the images um, themselves. So this is the example that's in the textbook, but it's actually one of the tamer images. Um, but I'll also show you this, uh, this one here called The Room. Um, there's been a lot of, I think a lot of people like to do some like Freudian analysis of, of Baltus's images. They're strange. Um, cats often turn up in them. I think it's interesting that one of the textbook doesn't have a cat. But it's really common, there's a cat sitting on a little table there, to see cats. And in fact, there was a, a big retrospective exhibition of Baltus's work at the uh, Met in New York about maybe a year and a half or two years ago. And it was called something like Cats and Girls or something. So that pretty much sums up uh, a lot of the content or the subject matter of um, Baltus's paintings. But you look at a, a work like this and you're just like, what is going on? And there's all of these kind of evocative illusions of a dark room and you know, light filtering into the space. And then is that you know, the person who's, the, who's opening the windows? Is it an adult or a child? It's just it's hard to tell. I always feel like I'm watching a David Lynch film you know, when I'm looking at Walt's painting. Is she, uh -huh. is she opening it or is she closing it? Or is she closing it? Yeah, so we can even draw, you know, we can even you know, ask that question as well. Yeah, it's you know, kind of heavy brow. So yeah, so it's it's and it's and it's the power. It's this ambiguity, I think, in this um, you know, it's very unsettling kind of work. And I think that in a lot of ways, it's the power um, of the paintings themselves. And but what's really interesting again is, is that Baltus didn't like to talk about his work. This is a quote from him. He gave a, an interview in the late. I want to say it was in the late '80s or the early '90s. Um, one of the few people, and this is an interesting and weird side that one of the few people that he granted an interview to was David Bowie, of all people. <laughs> uh, and, and part of it had to do with the fact that Baltus um, lived in Switzerland. Um, Bowie also had a house in Switzerland, where I think he lived most of the time. 
at that point, and they were neighbors, essentially. And they, I think I just got like Bowie and Baltus are like neighbors. Like I met him like hockey over the fence or something. Um, yeah, but yeah, no, it's weird. But in some ways, it isn't. I mean, it is. It isn't. Um, there's a, a British art journal called Modern Painters, and um, Bowie is on the editorial board, and he's one of the founders of it. And, it, and I'm a huge Bowie fan, as well, Bowie too, um, and have been for a very long time. Um, but he started out in art school, so he went to art school and then became a musician later. So he's had a, a really long-standing interest. He's a music painter as well. So, so those kind of things um, make sense. But and I think this quote is from that interview, and he says, I, and this is what Balta says, is that I think the eroticism that they always see in my painting is in the liquor. Right? And I think that's, and I'm not so sure, you know. I'm like, well, yes, I mean, obviously, in some ways. Um, but it's as if Balthus is trying to distance himself. I don't think um, he's trying as well. to say that people have a dirty mind, so they automatically assume the worst. Yeah, I think, and I think that that most people, you know, go that direction. It's true. Um, there was a, a, a huge exhibition of his work in 1968 at the uh, Tate Museum in Britain, and it was all in capital letters because that's how telegrams were sent. To us today, it looks like you're shouting. <laughs> so yeah, so it shouldn't come across as that. Um, and basically, the Tate wanted to know. Um, they wanted you know, so you go to a museum, you see exhibitions and quotes from the artists, and you know, texts on the wall and so on. And so they were trying to get him to give them information. And so this is what he sends to them, the, you know, via telegram. Uh, he says, no biographical details begin. And this is all of the text that he wanted in the exhibition. Um, Walthus is a painter of whom nothing is known. Now let us look at the pictures. <laughs> and you know, regards, you know, Baltus. And I think that's an interesting approach. And that's an approach certainly that some artists do take is that you should bring your own thoughts, ideas, experiences, you know, whatever, um, to the work. Uh, you know, the artist, you know, certainly has his or her own um, you know, experiences, ideas, and, and all of those other things. Um, but that in some cases the artist doesn't want the viewer to have you know preconceived notions. Um, about the work, and Balthus is certainly one of those. So Balthus is a Balthus is perplexing, intriguing, disturbing in some ways, um, but um, but always interesting. I think with, with different works.